I want to talk about the theme of scarcity and abundance as it applies to people. Um, and in particular, I want to use this um, term that I think was invented by the great psychometrician James Flynn um, called capitalization, which refers to the rate at which a given community capitalizes on the human potential of those in its midst. In other words, what percentage of those who are capable of achieving something actually achieve it? So that's the question, the theme of my little talk, which is, um, how high are capitalization rates in general um, in America? And the short answer to that question is that cap rates are really low. Um, they are much lower than you think they are. Um, and, and that's why I think this is such a, a worthy topic for investigation. Um, so what I want to do is talk about three conditions that I think hold down constrained capitalization rates in the United States. Now, condition number one is the one we've just talked about, and that's the case of Michael Oher, and that's poverty. And poverty is the obvious thing that limits the exploitation of human potential. I have a friend who um, works in uh, the inner city of Los Angeles in South Central, and he sets up, he goes, works with one specific school in a very, very poor area, and he basically finds kids who are academically gifted and gets them scholarships to private schools in Los Angeles. And I was chatting with him recently and he said, you know, the problem with this particular middle school that I work with is that the high school the kids have to go to requires them to cross gang lines. And as a result, basically none of the boys can go to high school. So there we have a cap rate for that community in Los Angeles, one of the richest cities in the world, is zero, right? Because if you don't go to high school, you basically can't achieve anything in our particular society. And that's a pretty um, astonishing fact, but it's one that we're familiar with. We know all about um, uh, the effect of poverty, the constraining effect of poverty on the capitalization of human potential. So let's talk about other um, uh, conditions that constrain cap rates. And what this is is the roster of the 2007 Medicine Hat Tigers. This is one of the greatest junior hockey teams in the world. What's strange about this is the birth dates of the members of the team. They're all born in the first half of the year, right? Now, this isn't just true of the Medicine Hat Tigers. This is true of elite hockey teams all around the world. And the explanation is very simple, and that is that in the world of hockey, the cutoff date for eligibility in any given year is January 1st. And all around the world, hockey establishments start recruiting all-star teams when kids are about eight or nine years old, right? So you look at all the kids who are playing hockey when they're eight years old, you choose the best ones, and you pull them out, put them in specialized programs, give them extra practice time, better coaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, when you are eight or nine years old, right, the difference in between being born in January and being born in December is enormous. So what they end up doing is choosing all the big kids, the kids born in January, thinking they're the talented ones when in fact they're not talented, they're merely big. But then what do they do with those big kids? Well, they give those big kids 10 years of specialized coaching, extra practice time, and more games until by the time they are 17 and 18, the kids who were just big in the beginning actually are the best. Right? So all around the world, this is a phenomenon that was discovered by the Canadian psychologist Roger Barnsley called the relative age effect. In absolutely every system in which hockey is played, um, a hugely disproportionate number of hockey players are born in the first half um, of the year. Now, um, you only have to look at this chart and realize what an incredible constraint on capitalization this is, right? Logic tells us there should be as many uh, great hockey players born in the second half of the year as born in the first half. But what we can see here is that basically there's almost no one born at the end of the year. Everyone's from the beginning. So common sense would say that if you simply started a second parallel hockey league, which had a cutoff date of June or July 1st and not January 1st, you should be able to develop twice as many elite hockey players. Right? So the capitalization rate for hockey players in Canada, a country, by the way, which takes hockey more seriously than any other country on the face of the earth, the cap rate for the thing that Canadians care more deeply about than anything else is 50%. Astonishingly low, right? And the constraint in this case is not poverty. The constraint in this case is the stubborn refusal on the part of the hockey establishment to acknowledge that they are very, very poor developers of talent. So this is not a poverty constraint, this is a stupidity constraint. In other words, so this is an example of uh, where uh, institutions get in the way of the development of human potential. Constraint number three is the most important of the constraints, and this is um, 
This comes from James Flynn, who I mentioned at the beginning. So Flynn got really interested in why it was that Chinese Americans, uh, Chinese American immigrants to the United States vastly outperform uh, white Americans. Why do they do so well? They come here, they don't know the language, they don't have any money, and within one generation, their kids are achieving at an extraordinary rate. And what he discovered is in the highest occupational rung, that is prof um, professional, managerial, technical, um, uh, the Chinese Americans had 55% of their population make that highest rung, and the same number for white Americans is 34%. That is a, that is a massive difference in, cap in capitalization between these two groups. So now why is that? Well, one very, for years, sociologists struggled with trying to explain why it is Chinese Americans do so well. And there's been a very, very um, serious and um, uh, extensive line of argument which says they're smarter. Their IQs are higher. Right? There's a British psychologist who would argue this for years, and there are many people who still believe this. But Flynn, who is the world's leading expert on IQ, very, very carefully went through the data and realized, actually, it's not true at all. So what is it? Well, what he found was two things. One is that, uh, one is that, uh, that Asian, Chinese American immigrants to America um, with average IQs perform as well, go as far in the world as um, white Americans with very high IQs. And the difference seems to be that a Chinese American with an IQ of 100 performs as well as, an Ameri a, a, as a white American with an IQ of 120. Um, the second thing, which is linked to the first, is that of the available pool of talent in the Chinese American community, their cap rates are way higher. Um, the cap rates for Chinese Americans um, in the professions, that is to say the percentage of people who are capable of, smart enough to be a professional, who end up being a professional, is 78%. Um, in the uh, white American community, that number is 60%. Now, why do they do so much better than if they're not? How are they able to so brilliantly capitalize on the available talent in their community? And the answer, uh, Flynn says, is because they work harder. Why do they work harder? Um, and the explanations are, um, are quite, it's quite fascinating when you dig into it. And I'll give you one little taste of that, and that is if you take um, a sense of just how deeply culturally ingrained these ideas about work are. If you take a group of, uh, of Chinese American, or, um, or, even, or we can go back to China, just straight Chinese, uh, school kids, say 10-year-olds, and a group of American 10-year-olds, and you give them both a very, very difficult math problem to solve, and you time them um, and see how long they work at it before they give up. The American kids will give up after two minutes, and if you have a 15-minute long window to see, the Chinese kids will still be working at the end of the 15 minutes. Right? That reflects very different attitudes about effort and persistence. And Flynn's argument, and I think he's right, is that when we look at these different rates of of capitalization uh, 20 and 30 years later, what we're seeing is the consequence of those early ingrained cultural notions about how hard one is supposed to work at a given task. And what we have in white America, in other words, is a cultural constraint on capitalization due to the fact that we think when faced with a hard problem that if you can't get the answer right away, um, you should go give up. Um, now, why is this discussion of capitalization so important? Um, it is important because I think when we observe differences in how individuals succeed in the world, our initial thought is always to say, to argue, that that is the result of some kind of innate difference in ability. We, and when we look at the different rates um, that groups succeed, we think that that reflects some underlying innate trait in um, the characteristics of that group. And that is wrong. What capitalization rates say, what the capitalization argument says, is there's another explanation, and that has to do um, with poverty, with stupidity, and with culture. Consider um, African American professional achievement um, in this country. You know, we cannot get rid of the notion in our public discourse that the reason African Americans don't succeed the way that white Americans do in this country is because of some inherent genetic failure on their part, right? That argument comes back, and it comes back, and it comes back. But think about this in terms of capitalization rates. What's the cap rate for, for a professional success among African Americans? You know, in Canada, the cap rate for hockey, the thing they care most about and spend all their time and energy thinking about is 50%, right? Well, black professional success is not something we care about at all. So how low possibly could that be? You know, Flynn points out that um, uh, by, the age, by age 45, 11% of white Americans are, white American males are either dead or dysfunctional. 
that's to say incapable of, of working in some way. The same figure for African Americans in this country is 34%. It is three times higher. He also points out that the number of, of African American ma men who are missing, that is to say, not in the army, not in prison, not showing up in the census, not showing up in the tax rolls, not showing up on Social Security, and who we only find out about when they die, the number who are missing is one million. Put those numbers together, and how low can the cap rate be? Right? If it's more than 5%, um, I would be stunned. Now, I think that it's only when you think about the race problem in this country in this way that you start to understand it, right? and when you start to, to grasp its true significance that we have a scarcity in, of achievement in this country, not because we have a scarcity of talent. We have a scarcity of achievement because we're squandering our talent. And that's not bad news, that's good news. Because it says that this scarcity is not something we have to live with. It's something we can do something about. Thanks very much.